Manager, I appear on WPGU 1071 and UPTV. James Boyd, Will Gerard, Jason Liggett doing some fun things. I'm Ryan Wilson on the last Robert Lini of the academic year, and for James Boyd and me, but we'll get to that later. Right now, James Snyder donning our Warden Lanai t-shirts, looking great, because we're now very fit. We, we finished the exactly. Illinois Marathon <laughs> 10K last Saturday. Seems like forever ago. Pretty much, yes. And we have some awesome footage. We did not finish last. I guaranteed, I, I made a promise to the University of Illinois that I would not finish last. And boy, did I not. I came close. Uh, so the final results, Will Gerard finished 1,230th of, bad, the, not bad. of the about 2,000 competitors. <laughs> uh, so I was right behind Will by four tenths of a second. A photo finish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and James somehow was right behind me finishing in position number 1,236. But we Check have the tape. video. But, to, uh, <laughs> I cross first. We're going to check our 360 footage and know that the results are wrong <laughs> because James finished ahead of both of us. I had to get the finish on Snapchat for the university. Yeah, so. So, so James was snapping away on the snapper chat and <laughs> running ahead of us, getting some nice shots. But James, what did you learn from this 10K you've done? You've done some running in, in high school, and now you just run across campus. <laughs> but what was it like for you running in a 10K? It was fun. Brought back a lot of memories from high school and, and the camaraderie I had with those guys. And obviously, I had the camaraderie, camaraderie I have with you guys. Um, so that was really fun. I remember how cold it used to be when I ran, and, and that was not a good memory to <laughs> gotta re- kind of revisit because it was so cold when we started. But towards the end, um, I think it was overall just a great experience for people to understand that no matter what, we finish. So chair, legs, wheels, shoes, finished, and it was, uh, it was solid. It was a great experience. And I think a lot of people were intrigued by your camera on your chair. Mm-hmm. And it was funny when everyone was like, oh, he's got a camera facing him. or facing him. <laughs> You're like, no, it's uh, facing You're everywhere. You're on it, too. It's yeah, a 360 it like camera. The, um, yeah. I enjoyed be- being referred to as the Rolling Illini by a lot of the yeah, spectators. Yeah, yeah, the Rolling Illini. Yeah, big time now. We added the the yeah. in there. So that was that was fun. And then it was kind of funny going back to the camera of the uh, Big Brother type of thing where, like, everyone around us is on the camera. Mm-hmm. So that was cool. Yep, we had a chance to check out our footage today with the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning. They provided the GoPro Fusion, our good friends over there. Jim Wentworth will be joining us in just a bit in the show to talk about virtual reality and what exactly that is and why do we need VR, because you do. Um, It's the future, guys. There's no no, choice in this matter? If you listen to Ruin Lana, you need to do VR. Man, this is like a dictatorship on our last (laughs) show. What's going on? Uh, Oh, no, I had a lot of fun in the 10K. What did I learn? Nothing. I learned that uh, you guys work hard. And I do not. I'm very thankful for that. Oh, I, did, I did learn something. <laughs> what do you mean? I learned that you cannot bring food on the field. <laughs> huh? Everyone freaked out on us when we brought food to uh, the field. You know, that's something Will didn't want us to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm bringing it up because I didn't like it. It was not, we, a, not, a, not a, I guess, a positive experience. One of us almost gave a police officer. <laughs> it was a, not a police officer. <laughs> it was a, a rent-a-cop. Let's make that clear. A ran- <laughs> <laughs> a random pedestrian, a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> we was pretty hi- hyped up about uh, eating that pasta. So <laughs> you guys give us a hard time. We were just trying to leave the stadium. Yes. Yeah. But besides were... that, it was a great, it was a great experience. <laughs> besides almost kicking some butts, great time. 
um, I learned, uh, I gained a, a more appreciation for wheelchair racers like Tatiana because the, the roads were very bumpy. I had to swerve around potholes and different places where cracks were in the road and trash and yeah we've had a part where we went over like i think it was cobblestone yeah so yeah. i do not like going over bricks um that's not a fun ride because i feel every bump every corner of every brick and all of that um fun experience i would do it again i think i would i'd do the 10 i'd do the half marathon let's just, yeah let's do the half marathon next year let's do it roll one night half marathon next year <laughs> Um, I'll you come down? back for it. I'm definitely down. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so serious. I'll start like actually training. I'm dead serious. That fast. Yeah. Yeah. Will did not train, as far as I know. It, it showed just a little bit during the race. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, my hair is a mess. That will show on the footage. Sorry. We also witnessed the tie, so that was pretty crazy. A tie yeah. during the marathon. Will and I? <laughs> no, not between oh. you two. Come we on. were. Waiting um, to get interviewed by WCIA, and then yes. we saw the two winners in the male um, able body marathon finish in a tie. So that was incredible mm-hmm. to watch that live. I think everyone was just kind of like, what just yeah. happened? And for them to go to the booth, to photos, to video, mm-hmm. and still award a tie, that's pretty epic. So. Yes, yeah, so we, got, we were so good that we got passed by the co-winner, I guess, twice. We didn't even see the other guy. And somehow exactly. he, like, caught, yeah. caught up. I, I wish he had a GoPro so we could see kind of how he caught up. Because, I right. mean, entering the stadium, it was like a dead sprint to see who would come up with the victory. So Yeah, quite a fun finish. I also learned a few lessons about the wind. Um, yes, it impacted my hair, my stylish hair at 6 a.m., <laughs> James, Your hair looks I wish, fine, right? I wish I had hair like you, man. Yeah, man. It's you nice and... F- you got the fade. Nice and aerodynamic, Aloha. you know. It doesn't hold me back too much. <laughs> yes, man. Mine is just there. Next year, you'll have to throw on a ball cap like I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going much faster. But... Nonetheless, James is answering a random phone call by me. Do you want me to answer, Do you I don't want know, me to James, you should open it. You should answer it. Say hello on air. Hello? Hi, this is Tana McFadden. Yes. <laughs> I, I'll come down to get you because uh, <laughs> Ryan here has got me um, on phone duty. I'm James Ford, <laughs> by the way. I'll be there in a second. Yes, so I gained a greater appreciation for the... That definitely just confused our listeners, like, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think Ryan should definitely <laughs> add, like, you know, IDs to his contacts. Yeah. Wow. Nah. Do you need the card to get up? Oh, yeah. yeah, so, surprise, surprise, Hannah McFadden is joining us in just a few minutes on her way up. James <laughs> Boy is struggling to get on, get past the camera set up in the corner here, uh, but he made it. But I don't think he, he unplugged it. anything there. If he can do a 10 he can do the limbo. But, so, Hannah McFadden will be joining us in just a bit to discuss her recent trip to Washington, D.C. to discuss the future of mobility and what that exactly looks like of course she is sponsored by toyota not too bad wish i was sponsored by toyota but we're not not yet maybe next year um and so we'll be talking with her and jim wentworth and just a bit it's only fitting to start the year with one mcfadden sister and end it i with know another. we started with um, with tatiana we end with hannah couldn't ask for more so we're not but, again, back to the 10K, I learned more about the wind because when we were blowing in the wind, I felt like it kind of slowed us down a bit, just like you're kind of in a car. You know, if you drive toward the wind, it'll slow you down. It'll affect your gas mileage. Luckily, I don't run on gas. But if you're, if you're going with the wind, then you may go a little bit faster. And going downhill, for wheelchair racers, they can coast. They don't have to, uh, to worry about speeding up. So, very good experience. Well, what did you learn? Um, well, that was my... Like, this may come as a surprise to a lot of our listeners out there if you're familiar with my background. But being from Champaign, I've never really been all that involved with the Illinois Marathon. So, for me, just the whole spectacle was um, incredible. You know, getting the chance to see how many people volunteer for that event and 
how many um, spectators there are al along the route. So that was really cool in itself. Um, I thought it was um, awesome getting the chance just to interact with uh, other people running the 10K. I mean, like you mm -hmm. said earlier, there were quite a few people who were very intrigued by uh, what we were doing. So that was um, that was fun to kind of, you know, just give them a quick, quick rundown of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was great. I mean, I was not ready to run a 10K. Like, I, I will make that clear for everyone out there. Like, I did not do much after the race itself, but <laughs> adrenaline definitely got me through it, and I would do it, do, do it again any time because that was yes. one of the highlights of my year by far. You know, I joke that I have spent 22 years of my life preparing for this moment, which is true, as I've been in a power chair for 22 years, or almost. But even I was tired afterward because that was a long race, an hour and 19 minutes for us. Mile one and mile two were rough. Yeah, it, w it wasn't the smoothest ride. I mean, that was yeah. that was apparent to me as well. Just like looking over at you, I'm, I'm sure you, you felt a few of those bumps. I sure did. I felt all the bricks and bumps and potholes, but I tried to be careful. Didn't want to break an arm. Yeah, I got a big big shout out to uh, Stretch Ledford too. Who we we called him at about six thirty seven o'clock in the morning to have he we were missing a, a piece for him out and he, he came. So you know. Thank, thanks to him for make, making that happen. Yes, yes. We were setting up the GoPro Fusion on my chair and realized at about 6.15 a.m. on uh, last Saturday. Hi, James. I think I have some more. Hi, Anna. We're going to take a quick break here. We've got fun stuff in store. Let's hand him a that and we'll be right back here. Welcome back. James wants me to change up the intro, so I did. <laughs> James Boyd, Will Gerard, Jason Liggett, I'm Ryan Wilson here on World Atlanta and WPG 1071 and UPTV. Now we're joined by Hannah McFadden. Again, we started the academic year with Tatiana and thought, why not end it with Hannah? So we are fun stuff. And Hannah, you were in Washington, D.C. last weekend for uh, Toyota in the future of mobility, I know we just talked about this, but run our audience through what future mobility, the future of mobility looks like. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so the future of mobility, I think, can be for everyone. It's not just for people who with disabilities. It's for how do we get somewhere safe and as fast as possible. Um, what are the best devices? You know, they're trying to get like braces that walk for people. They're trying to get cars that drive because it's car accidents is such a high rate of death for everyone in the United States. So I think it's just really looking to the future and using all the intelligence we have. Sharp answer. <laughs> Interesting. So what does it look like specifically for somebody who has a disability or impairment? Well, I think it depends what you're looking at. So for racing, you know, that's my expertise, is that we're coming up with, you know, lighter gloves or coming up with seat buckets that actually are designed specifically for your body so you're completely in it like a pair of like skinny jeans um, and then I think off the track it looks like how can we make a car accessible um, do we put the door in reverse so someone can just get in the wheelchair and put it straight in the back of the seat um, and I think it's just stuff like that those easy ideas that we can actually just make them happen and more accessible to everyone so as, as you were Talking about this stuff in D.C., what was the reaction from people? Um, I think the reaction in general is that everyone's interested, but we never really have that open-door conversation. And I think the best way for change is you have to start with a conversation. You have to listen from both sides, see what is known, what is not. You have to also get rid of stereotypes. And I think it's just sort of spreading that awareness. So when you say stereotypes... <laughs> Um, what are you referring to specifically in terms of mobility? And are those stereotypes coming from, like, government officials, or where is that at? Oh, so stereotypes. Um, well, I think just in general, people are disabled. The stereotype is that you can't do much. Um, they like to assume things, and I'd rather be asked a question than someone put me in a box. So I think one could be, oh, they don't need the fast things. They're not going anywhere. Or... You know, they're not an elite athlete because they're missing a leg. So I think it's just really getting that equality and showing that, like, I'm here and I'm here to stay and I want the same as everyone else. So, okay. 
So take us through, we talked about mobility, but take us through how you became a part of Toyota and how that um, came about and, and all of that good stuff. All right. Um, so I started story my, time. I know, story time, all <laughs> about me. No, I started racing when I was 16 years old. That's my first Olympic team. And then I made my next Olympic team in Rio. I got fourth place, so that was a bit heartbreaking. And then Toyota met with me. They said, what do you need? And just like anybody with equipment, if your equipment is not to the top point, you won't go far. You could be the best athlete, but if your wheelchair is a piece of clunk, you won't go fast. So I said, I need a new seat. And so we designed a seat just for me. And I think from then they realized that we could really just help each other out with that partnership. So, so how is your seat different from somebody else's then? Okay, so a lot of people, uh, when they're racing, they kneel on their legs. And that's super uncomfortable for me because I can feel mine. I only have one. So it just goes numb and I'm just very un, like, in even. So one weight's more on one side, which caused me to be very like, inefficient with my stroke. So my seat just looks different because it's actually like I sat in beads and you sort of just sit there and they mold to your body. Um, so it's just specifically designed for me. So it's just having that actual mold made for me while others can just have a simple tray and they're fine. So what type of differences have, or, or in performance have you seen from getting the chair and what type of relief have you given um, from that? So, I mean, I was fourth in the 100 meters for, world, uh, for Rio. And then a year after that, world championships, I got third in the 100 and then third in the 200. So I definitely made that type of improvement. Um, and then I would just say I'm way more comfortable in my chair now. I, I used to always just, like, want to cry because it was so uncomfortable. And my coach would just send me on these, like, mile workouts. They were it was a bad time, but now I'm a little more comfortable, and I just know my chair is, like, ready for anything. So it just sort of takes that mental stress out of the game, and I can just actually focus on, like, the physical part of racing. Yeah. Producer man Will Gerard speaking. One quick follow-up question I have to ask you about London is, what was it like to be the youngest member of Team USA during that game? I mean, was, it, was it a little surreal for you? I mean, at the uh, age of 16, as a high schooler or something, like I you probably didn't, didn't know expect. what I was doing. I didn't have a coach at that time. So it was all up in the air. I mean, it was definitely such a surreal experience, especially like opening ceremonies when you realize like how much bigger it is and it's not just about you. But it definitely was really cool and I think it really got me hungry because I wasn't really a fan of track. I thought going in circles was really boring. <laughs> um, so that definitely sparked my interest in it. Uh, so if it's really boring to go in circles then, then what inspired you to, to to go in those circles. To go in those circles every yes. day. Um, I think I just realized, like, I want to be faster than I was yesterday. And so every day I'm like, okay, what am I doing to improve myself, make myself better? And I also am just really competitive. Like, I don't like coming in last. Um, I like that first place. So I think it's just that drive and just keep pushing myself. Because there's no such thing as a perfect race. So it's how close can you come to it? You probably get this question a lot, but is there a bit of sibling rivalry then? Oh, between the you sibling and your rivalry is real. <laughs> um, on and off the track, we race each other home. Who can drive the fastest route? Like it's crazy, but um, yeah, there's definitely sibling rivalry. Like rivalry, I think there's all any any that will happen anytime. I mean, at the end of the day, if I can't win, I would want her to win. So I think that's what keeps us balanced. I love that answer. <laughs> if she can't win, I want to win. If I can't win, she can win. That's pretty cool. Learning a lot every day. Uh, racing at home. Are you guys in your vehicles racing? Oh. Like drag racing side. I by mean, side? it's like, you know, if, so it's, you know, if you have Neil Street and you know left lane is going to be a winner, but she'll go in the right lane and you have to know when to merge, when not to, if you should follow that truck, is it going to get you? <laughs> so it's like that. It's that smart technical error, like, who should I stay behind? <laughs> Racing is clearly in the DNA. <laughs> yes. Competing is in the DNA. Will is just busting up laughing over there. <laughs> he knows how to race, I think. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, we, we saw it during the, the 10K. Yeah, we also, I barely we kept up with you guys. Oh, wow. That's more than I did. <laughs> it's okay. It was a long race. It took me an hour and 19 minutes. Props to you. I stayed home for that one. <laughs> Good choice, freezing. But we would do it. Any day, I think, I would do this kind of marathon. Maybe race you sometime. Fun? Probably do. <laughs> um, but to, to get these partnerships um, in the Paralympic movement for you, 
Um, what does that mean exactly? I think it would be vocal. Um, once again, just that conversation you need to have. And I always, always tell people, I'd rather you ask me a question than you presume what I can and cannot do. And I think it's just that. So if you people are interested, they just don't know what the Paralympics is about, what it means, different classifications. So I think it's just taking that patience and telling people, setting them straight, and actually be able to correct them. So I think people are always afraid to. And um, I'm vocal, so I do not have a problem doing that. But I think it's just being, you know, vocalized, and not only just for yourself, but also for the younger generation that's coming up. Yeah. So as you've traveled the world in places that I want to go. Um, how has the reaction been to people with impairments, maybe you, um, maybe like the U.S. or in other countries and like that? You know, I think at this U.S. we have so many amazing things, but then we we'll go to places like the U.K. and they treat their like para athletes amazing. The Olympic Stadium in London did not sell as many tickets as the Paralympic Games. The Paralympic Games sold out. And the Olympic Games did not. So I think that just shows in general, like they love their Paralympics. And the US, we still get confused. What are the Paralympics? Is it the Special Olympics? It's, you know, what are they? Are, what are they? So I think in general, it's just that lack of communication. And then even in media, you don't ever see anyone with a disability. And if you do, they're really extreme or they can't do anything. So on the sidelines, clapping. And so I think it's just showing that they're. We can do the same thing, if not better, but no. <laughs> not say better. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the marathon times, usually faster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so why is the U.S. still, US still trying to, to learn more about the Paralympic movement? I mean, I think we go back to media. The U.S. is still having a hard time showing race in media. The U.S. is still having a hard time showing people who aren't stick thin figures. So I think it's just that whole, we have such a weird concept of beauty and we still are just stuck in that one mindset. So I think it's just exposure, really. Mm-hmm. We need more of that from any everything. Yeah, uh, uh, making me think. Maybe I should start like wearing makeup and <laughs> posting on Twitter some pretty hey. pictures of myself. It's working for some people, so go <laughs> for it. Me and my workout routines that don't exist. Oh, <laughs> uh, interesting. So I know on social media you've been uh, very active about your happenings and Paralympic stuff and all of that. Um, How has that helped you, social media helped you get your message across? Well, I actually hate social media. Oh, okay. (laughs) Boom. Next question. But no, no, no. I think I hate it because it's one of those platforms people only post the happiest, best time of their lives. And I don't think life is like that. Um... Like, I have workouts every day that I'm like, why am I doing this sport? And people, I think, just are showing not a fake version of themselves, but not the true version either. So I think that's the issue with social media. Or if they post something, they want that sort of pity clap with it. Um, so I think there's that fine line that goes with it. But I'm, I'm always just really true on social media. Like, I'll tell you if it was a bad race. I'll tell you if it was good. But I think social media is just, once again, I think the best thing is just to show the workouts. To show people, yeah. like, I'm doing the exact same thing as the Olympian would. Yeah, so you talk about showing your true self on social media. How has, or has, um, para-athletics for you helped you express kind of your true self? So, I remember, like, growing up, I hated P.E. class. Right? Like, I was like, please get me out of this, like, somehow. But I loved the push-up test because I was the one thing I could beat <laughs> everyone in that class. So I think so that, like, you know, hunger sort of took from there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, definitely I think just you have to just keep pushing yourself and then just show it and be humble about it. Yeah. I think just walk your life. I don't know. You just yeah. got to do it. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for yeah, having I really me, guys. appreciate it. Right back for more, we'll be talking about virtual reality with Jim Winsworth. We'll be back. Welcome back to One Line Here, WPG 1071 UPTV. Getting my picture taken by the great Jim Wentworth from the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, James Boyd, Will Gerard, Jason Leggett, 
we're all here to talk about virtual reality. I know Jim, I think, will be living with you next week, um, editing footage of, from our Illinois Marathon 10K fun adventure last week. But take us through what is virtual reality and, and how is that experience different from watching a regular YouTube video? Okay, well, uh, virtual reality is certainly much more immersive than the video we're used to watching. So we're used to seeing things on screens framed by, uh, you know, four sides and where uh, virtual reality allows you to completely immerse yourself. So you can turn around, look in every direction, and um, it's really hard to explain unless you've given it a try, but you should definitely try it out. <laughs> yeah, only, mm. it, was, it was incredible. I took a peek today, and, um, yeah, it was, it was honestly eerie. I felt like I was... Just reliving the race again, like just yeah. with better memory. So that was that was pretty cool. Yep, we stuck a GoPro Fusion on my chair for the 10K. Got some great footage, kind of just above my eye level. James and Will got to try on a headset and have some good fun from my point of view. It's not too spectacular, right? Not from my point of view. I mean, I don't care. I, it could be uh, from any point of view. Like it was, I mean, it was honestly incredible to look around and and, yeah. and see every angle, yeah, every person that we literally ran by. So, mm -hmm. like I said, it was like the Twilight Zone. It was eerie. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into VR, Jim? Uh, well, at, at the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning, where I work there, um, we opened up these labs last fall, and uh, kind of by happenstance, we decided uh, virtual reality was a niche on campus that wasn't really being investigated, at least not made available to everybody on campus. So there's plenty of stuff over at engineering and computer science. We wanted to open up a lab that anybody could use and access. And then um, we stumbled upon this great camera that you used for the race, the Fusion um, uh, GoPro Fusion 360. And that just allows you to shoot something in 360 degrees entirely, um, sky to ground, all the way around you. And so I think uh, a race experience is a perfect kind of thing for a medium like this. Yeah, I know we were on Channel 3 after our race, and they're asking about our GoPro Fusion, and they thought the camera was just on me. I'm not that selfish, I don't think. <laughs> I might be, I don't know. But then we talked about Jason. <laughs> uh, so we talked about how the, the camera is coming from all sides. So right now, if I had a GoPro Fusion, James would be on it, Will, you, everybody would be on it. So it's a whole experience. But with that also comes the ability to take people to places they've never been before. Um, how is that kind of uh, a defining factor for VR. Yeah, well, particularly VR that's that's made this way with a 360 camera really allows a photographer, a media expert, to, to take the camera anywhere and capture scenes that in, a, in an entirely new way. So where we used to have to point the video camera and focus on something, now we just take this camera into an environment that's worth capturing. And so um, whether it's kind of virtual field trips and taking people around the world, uh, what, which we couldn't necessarily do in a class, for, for instance, um, to, uh, to experiences like yours, where you get to go do something adventurous and kind of capture that and see it from all angles, see everybody involved. Yeah, and I know one thing we've talked about is VR and empathy, and I just uh, found that so fascinating. Um, how can VR kind of yield empathy? Well, if you, th if you think about it, if you have the opportunity to go out and meet people in the real world, maybe, you know, people you wouldn't come across in, in the United States, um, so traveling to uh, some third world countries um, and coming across cultures you might not uh, see, you develop a sense of empathy. You meet people, you um, get to know them better, and empathy is kind of a natural result. Um, and we're hoping that VR can emulate at least some of that. So not everybody gets the chance to travel. Mm -hmm. And so this allows people perhaps to, to put themselves in these locations they wouldn't go otherwise and see how other people are living. And through that, we're hoping that, that a sense of empathy will develop. Yeah, so with VR, how has it taught you more about empathy? Well, I, I think it's interesting. You get to see things from a perspective you wouldn't normally see. And so, um, for instance, again, you're, you're shooting this race, allows me to put on a headset and experience the race the way you experienced it. And that's something I never would have been able to do before a technology like this. And it just opens your eyes, opens anybody's eyes to kind of how different the world is, and yet it's the same. 
you know, it's just slightly different perspectives. Uh, maybe you get a chance to travel places you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's really remarkable technology. James, did it open your eyes? I mean, for sure. I, I felt like it was probably clearer than what I was seeing on race day. So <laughs> it was pretty cold. The elements were getting to me. But um, honestly, it was, it was honestly like reliving it. And it was weird. Um, a little weird seeing myself on camera and seeing just everyone involved with the race, the campaign. Um, but overall, I think it will be a great video to share with a lot of different people just so, so they can see what we were doing, why we were doing it, and kind of relive the moment with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the idea with the 10K was to uh, force James and Will to run <laughs> 6.2 miles and me just sit there. No, actually, kind of. No, actually, we, uh, the goal of it was to kind of redefine what it's like to have a disability, um, disability in air quotes, of course. And, and I think through our 10K, you get an idea of what's it like in a 10K, but what's it like uh, maneuvering through thousands of people in a power chair around bumps, trash. You do you're dodging some chocolate by Will Gerard, random chocolate and jelly beans. But it was an interesting experience nonetheless. Um, and Jim, what would you personally like to get out of a VR from uh, your students or even our project? What would you like to learn from? Well, well, for one, now I can experience the race without ever having to run it, and uh, I, I'm probably never going to be in that race, and now I can get to enjoy it anyway. Uh, but honestly, I think we're at a, uh, a time where this is a brand new medium, and there's lots of exploration to be done, and so trying to, to get students just experimenting with technologies like these, I think it's the next generation that will dream up how to tell great stories through this new medium and what we can do with these things that was never possible before. Yeah, so we have all this innovative technology but what's next for vr and and how does accessibility tie into that well i i think um vr probably one of the main areas we'll see B vr develop very quickly is in sports and entertainment and i think we'll see uh VR cameras like the one you used in a race out on the fields before long and putting people in places again where they wouldn't be able to go before. Um, and then as, as far as um, the accessibility, I think again, it allows people who might not be able to travel places they would love to, to go to still experience those in a very meaningful way. It's, um, it's so immersive that you do feel like you're there. Um, you can capture the environment, you can capture the sound. And so in ways, it, it does open up worlds to people who maybe uh, wouldn't travel otherwise. Yeah. All right, Jim. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We do really appreciate your help and uh, value your, your time with us. We're moving in soon. Us, us youngsters <laughs> will pack our bags and move into your office next week. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing the end product, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break here on the line in WPGU 1071 and UPTV. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to Warren Lana here on WPGU 1071 and UPTV. Jason Leggett's still here, James Boyd, Will Gerard. I'm Ryan Wilson. Jim Wentworth just skedaddled now to grab like a ticket word. for the uh, Kentucky Derby with his wife. Great fun. But now on our last segment of the academic year, I have not the faintest idea of what I'm going to say. I have wrote nothing down. What's the deal? <laughs> we, we, like, up. <laughs> we like to have an agenda of our plans. I have nothing for this. So I'll just sit here in silence. All right, that was good. <laughs> that was the show. No, um, you know, we've had a good, a good run on Warren Lana. We'll be back next year, but James and I will be graduating. What are we doing? No idea after this. I am banking on retirement. I have all my SSI money stored up. I am ready to do nothing the rest of my life. But... We've had some great fun here on One Line Act, from interviewing Craig Spence, Leon Dash, Hannah McFadden, Tatiana McFadden, and all these other great people have sat in this chair. Not Craig, 
vicariously he was with us, but not today. Jean Driscoll was my personal favorite. Yes. I wish we could have talked to her for an entire hour. Yeah, Jean, you can call us right now and get on air. The phone may not work, but that's a different story. Our phone line's open if you want to just chat with me. Any, that that, that, and that uh, applies to anyone out there, by the way. Our uh, request <laughs> line is 217-337-1071. All right, I'll call it Give right now. Give producer man Will Gerard a call, please. All right, I'm doing that right now, Oh, Will. goodness. Um, so I'm very thankful for James and Will uh, for the assistance with the show. Um, didn't expect to do half the things we did on the show from the 10K um, it's really incredible where this show has come. We're getting a call oh, right we're now. We're actually getting a call. I guess I'll have to answer. Oh the my phone. gosh, who is it? It, it might better be. not be you, Ryan. <laughs> Hello. Hi, is this uh, Will Gerard? Oh my goodness, <laughs> this dude. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was me. I was calling our studio, um, but I I did not. <laughs> Jason's once cracking. again two one seven three three seven one zero seven one. I will call again. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I started the show with Kane Walters. Kane sat in Will's chair. Former producer man. Shout out to Kane. Um, he was uh, uh, a monumental figure um, with me and Will in getting this thing started. It started with a proposal to PGU on what we wanted to do. Of course, we all sat down and said, we want to talk about disabilities and impairments. But the reality is we started talking about uh, love and empathy and mental illness. And, and that uh, is something that I'm always interested in. But I didn't expect to immerse ourselves into it as much as we did on the show. And I'm very grateful for that because not too many sports radio shows talk about the stuff we do. Um, so I think that makes us extra special. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I want to take a moment, too, just to thank both of you for your um, time to this program. And even, you know, away off the airwaves, you guys have been, um, you know, you guys have supported me so much this year in terms of my um, academic career, my journalism goals that I have. And I just know that um, I feel like you guys are always like a strong support system for me personally. I mean, I love you guys so much. It's been, a, it's been an honor and a privilege to work alongside both of you. So, you know, thank you so much. Uh, James is <laughs> laughing. Yeah, laughing to keep from crying, honestly. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a great ride. Yeah. I think a lot of the experiences that we've had have bled over into other different aspects of my life. Even the last story I did for the DI, um, which I don't think I even plugged the, the story. Um, Joy Peters, uh, A Journey re Just Google that and the story will come up. It's on our Daily Line I long form site where it kind of talks about his journey from being a um, gymnast and not having the career he wanted and not having it turn out the way he wanted due to injuries and then kind of segueing into being a team manager and mechanic and 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 it's an all-around guy for the wheelchair track team so that story would never happen if i wasn't a rolling line eye uh, my perception of what disability is and impairment is um retweet keep going what, what all of that stuff means and, and doesn't it wouldn't have happened without this i think i'm a, I'm a very firm believer that disability Impairments do not mean inability. It just means getting it done a different way. So we've done that in a multitude of different ways this semester, whether it's been you know, late nights and Greg doing the Amanda video or, you know, interviewing people at 2 a.m. and things like that. And also, is raised. you know, uh, doing 360 VR video, like just things that, you know, six, seven months ago, I'd have never, ever expected to do. So this has been a fantastic ride. Yeah, you guys have... We, this show has definitely opened my eyes, personally, to so many different um, people on this campus who I wouldn't have interacted <laughs> with before. And it, it's been, um, you know, incredible just hearing about their experiences, and I look forward to um, continuing it next year. So, I mean, you, to you listeners out there, you know, feel free to join me. You know, I'm looking for some, some people. <laughs> yes. Will is hiring uh, mainly dogs and cats. Mm-hmm. A lot of um, puppies. <laughs> Any parapets in there or no? Or no? Maybe. Mm, we'll see. <laughs> We'll have some more content on that next week, maybe, sometime. Um, but I know ever since spring break, I feel like Rowan Lana has just uh, done some exciting things about almost every day, um, from partnering with the Center for Innovation and teaching and learning. I'm very grateful for that. 
you know, I think the reality is we're students. Um, they didn't really know us that well. They knew me through my trip to Colorado, but I mean, still they hadn't seen any of my work. And so they were just risking uh, breaking equipment just for us. We didn't break it. Um, it just bopped James on the nose one time. <laughs> um, but we didn't break anything, I promise. It all works just fine and looks great. Um, but the partnership with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation has been spectacular. Um, learned a lot about CP through that, Cerebral Palsy, and how it affects people and how it's diagnosed. Um, it's not always diagnosed uh, at the appropriate time, and then that changes different factors, and it's different for each person, just like my impairment, osteogenesis, imperfected, or let's stick with OI, because it's a mouthful. Um, but I did not expect to talk about my impairment as much as I have on air, and I kind of wanted to, but I didn't expect it to uh, manifest itself in the ways it did. By that I mean I'm um, doing a 10K, and... Which you'd been talking about for quite a while until we really started yeah. making those formal Yeah, I, I remember telling, I, I talked about our 10K in my uh, cultural and disabilities class this past week, and I remember telling them, I don't know when the idea became concrete, yeah. <laughs> but the idea was out there, and we... Spoke uh, into existence. Yeah, Ryan was like, let's do it, and, and everyone kind of looked around like, well, yeah, let's do it for real. So mm -hmm. that was, that's definitely one of the top five top three top one experiences of being here at the university so that was that was incredible man and just the support we've got from people even just running by that knew the rolling line i so that was pretty cool yeah they read our bibs but that's besides the point <laughs> um i really i thoroughly enjoyed that experience um a lot of work a lot of work left to do but that's okay um i'm all in for that i've stayed up till 3 a.m the past two days working on our stuff, but I could do it any day, honestly, for for our show. I don't feel tired. I'll just be, I'll just knock out after this. Quite a few late nights for Ryan Wilson. No, I mean, not too bad. As of late, my teachers have been a little heavy on the assignments. <laughs> I wonder uh, why with this uh, time hey, of the year. Hey, I am 100% in agreement. <laughs> uh, I feel like I do not have one easy class. But that's all right. <laughs> Classes are over. Uh, school's over and soon enough, so. Yeah. Um, I think my priorities have significantly changed this semester. Um, grades will be quite different than last semester. Hey, you'll have a diploma. I know. D's get you. diplomas. <laughs> um, In all seriousness, Your though, parents are listening right now. I will, <laughs> I will say... Um, <laughs> I got asked this question. I was going to interview this morning for um, a class project. I talked to a lady um, about her disability or an impairment, and she was asking me, like, what's next for you? What do you want to do? I was like, I don't really know, but whatever I do, I definitely want to continue to tell stories um, about people that are minorities, underrepresented, misrepresented, because that, to me, matters more than the box score. I've written I don't know how many previews, recaps, and game stories and the joke I always tells me when you go to write a game story, there's 30 other people there writing the same story as you. So, yes, mm. don't, don't get me wrong. They're very good at what they do. And I can like to, I'd like to think that I want to get there someday and be just as good, if not better, as writing game stories. But that doesn't, that doesn't spark me. That doesn't push me to do anything. So when I tell stories about people that might have an, an impairment or um, say they're undocumented or when it comes to... I think I, I actually wrote a story about Illinois' op first openly gay athlete, um, um, Fred, Freddie Hartville, for um, the Illinois men's basketball, not in Illinois men's basketball, Illinois, Illinois men's gymnastics team. And those type of stories really, really mean a lot to me because I feel like they are not, those groups, those groups of people are not given the platform to always tell their experience. So by sitting and listening to them, I try to share with everyone else, and I think I want to keep doing that for the rest of my life. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, I don't think uh, covering para-athletes is any different from covering able-bodied athletes like um, D. Brown or Darren Williams. It's all the same. I think with somebody like um, Ryan Nicewinder, his impairment is just more visible. Um, like you can see that I'm in a chair. If you can't, then... 
I'm sorry. Um, you're not looking in the right way. Um, but you need to refocus your uh, yeah. 360 look, VR. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look it down. Um, but it's really all the same, and then I think that goes back to our show uh, in which we're redefining what a disability is. Um, it's really nothing. Um, it, it just changes our perception of people. I mean, it's, I think it's because you could look at me and say, oh, man, he's going to UFI. That's so spectacular. How does he get out of bed? Sometimes I wonder how I get out of bed because I don't want to do my homework. Well, you've even come such a long way from where you were as when you first came to university. I mean, covering golf and, you know, you were doing some other writing for the DI. And now, I mean, you want to talk, tell our listeners about what you're doing now, some of your uh, long-term aspirations. I mean, we, we got about, what, two minutes here? Yeah, so... We got all quick. the time we want. Yeah, we're just going to hang out in the studio we'll until someone fun. kicks us out. Yeah, so I came to the U of I three years ago, joined the Daily Alina. I started covering women's golf, was moved to men's golf, covered a... And this was after being, what, the sports editor at your prior school? Uh, the editor You were the editor-in-chief, no yeah. big deal or anything. So uh, you, had, you had a lot of writing experience already. Oh, gosh, I got burnout. That's besides the point. So I was covering men's golf, covered them in their uh, championship run. They came up close came up short in the run and then I made the decision I think I, I probably could have been moved to volleyball or women's basketball just because that's the usual track um, but I decided to, to take what they may call as a step down and cover wheelchair basketball and wheelchair athletics because nobody else was and, and I wanted to do that because they're doing these great things they're athletes too um, it's just we're not covering them. Why? Wish I could say I don't know, but um, it's because they're just not that popular as compared to men's golf who are on the Big Ten Network, and then they call me, and then I'm like, well, why isn't Ryan Nicewander on the BTN, or why isn't Emily Oberst on the BTN? And so I switched down to, to Milch Basketball, and then I slowly faded away from that into this and I think I made the right decision and I appreciate your guys' support it's been fun I feel like I just won an Academy Award <laughs> um, but I didn't win anything that's when a soft music starts get that guy out of here <laughs> I can hear it coming <laughs> uh, it's just a fan sorry um, but it is 7 o'clock and so I guess that means Jason what does that mean I forgot do we end the show? I guess you end the show, yeah. Do we have any final uh, words for J- from Jason here? Putting him on He is sticking to his, his job. Yeah. Well, like thanks, thanks to J- <laughs> thanks Jason for coming on. Because yes. I mean, this was uh, new for this year, too. We was getting broadcast yes, on. Yes, uh, Jason, U- thank uh, you so much. Always getting the angles. Indeed. Yes, you're getting James's <laughs> best side, and you're still trying to find my best side. I totally get it. <laughs> As am I. Um, I think my sister caught a few uh, last week in the studio. She got some good pictures. She got she got a, a very authoritative finger point by me. <laughs> I noticed that one. Um, strange picture, but Chloe Rose Gerard, shout out to her. Got some great pictures and great um, future ahead of her. But it's now seven to one. We're we getting overtime for this? No, we're not. Am I getting extra credit? Nope. I'm right here for one one um, so I think for one last time, Man. we're going to end the show for James Boyd, Jason Liggett. I'm just staring at Jason. <laughs> I can't <laughs> take it. Eyes I can't him. take it. <laughs> Will Gerard, I'm Ryan Wilson. Thank you all for listening. Um, we do value your time and, and recognize the um, newness of our show and, and the, the effort you, you took to, to listen to us, and us youngsters, doing a new idea, new adventure. But thank you so much. So um, Stay tuned. We have more some stuff coming, too. Yeah, do follow us on social media. We'll be covering parapets and uh, 10K and all of that stuff. You can still donate to our campaign. 
davidlana.com slash Lana. So, going to uh, sign off and uh, see you next year. At least Will will be here. And maybe uh, Jason. I'll be back. Yeah, okay. We'll have to plan a few, few reunions. Yeah. For sure. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, have a nice summer. Uh, I'll be uh, in my retirement home sipping. Stop it. From, uh, a Stop sippy it. Cup and, okay. You're going to be doing group big stuff this summer, I'm sure. Uh, maybe. Probably. Homework. <laughs> big stuff. All right. Bye. Bye.